So this is the effect that we're creating today. It's a awesome looking glitch effect that you can apply to any of your P5.js sketches. So stick around to see how it's done. There'll be code in the description so you can go and play around with it right now. And please excuse my voice. I'm still just getting over COVID. So you'll have to bear with me. Let's get into it. So it might look like we're starting off with a lot of code and I guess relative to my other videos, we kind of are, but I promise I'll explain it all in just a second. Firstly, I just want to point out that I am now using WebGL mode for this tutorial. So the only way we can get shaders to work in P5.js is if we change the renderer type to WebGL. Going into WebGL mode has a few little quirks, but we'll get into all of that in a minute. Firstly, I'm going to explain what all this other code is. If you watched my last video on the scratch off reveal effect, this will be quite familiar to you, the code that we've already got here. If you haven't, that's okay. You can watch it up here. And otherwise I'm going to explain what's going on right now. So for this effect, we're going to draw our, whatever we want our glitch effect to apply to onto a second off screen canvas. And then we're going to draw that canvas onto the screen and then the glitch effect will get applied to that. And in order to do that, I've set up a screen variable here, which I populate with the create graphics function. And this just creates that off screen canvas that we can draw to. So with the screen made, I now apply some settings to it. So I make the background a dark gray. I make the stroke color white, and then I bump up the stroke weight so that we can see it a bit better inside the draw function. What I'm doing is I'm checking if the mouse is pressed and if it is, I'm drawing drawing a line between the mouse position and the previous mouse position. And I'm drawing that line onto our screen object, not onto the normal display. And like I was saying before, we have to actually display this off screen screen onto our actual screen. Sorry, there's a lot, a lot of screens going on. But the way we do that is we call the image function and we pass in our screen as the image that we want to display. And you can see here, the coordinates I'm giving it are a bit janky and that's because of this whole WebGL thing. So this is one of those quirks I was mentioning before. The zero zero coordinate in WebGL mode is actually in the center of the screen, not the top left corner like we're used to. So I've just had to offset this image by half of the width and height to get it displaying where we want. And when we run this, you can see we've got our screen that is a dark gray. And when we click and drag, we get our lines drawn in a nice white. And this is the foundation of what we're going to apply our glitch effect to. Now you can draw whatever you want onto this screen object. It can be images, circles, rectangles, whatever you want. So this whole glitch effect relies on using a shader program. Now a shader program is a special kind of program that gets run on your graphics processing unit. And I'm not going to go fully into depth in this because it's just such a broad topic. I'm just going to barely scratch the surface so that we can get this glitch effect working. Thankfully P5 makes it pretty simple to set up a shader. So all I've done is I've got a shader object here called glitch shader. And then in the preload function, I'm just calling the load shader function and giving it a shader.vert and a shader.frag. Neither of these files actually exist yet. We're going to create them in a minute, but I'm just going to quickly touch on what vert and frag are in reference to. At its most basic level, the way these shaders work is there's a vertex shader and a fragment shader. And this is what vert and frag uh, in reference to. We're not going to have to worry about vertex shaders for today. We're only going to worry about the fragment shader, but in a nutshell, a vertex shader just takes geometry and figures out where each of those points of that geometry should be on the screen. And then the fragment shader, which is what we're going to be focusing on, takes each individual pixel and figures out which color it should be. I'll only be showing you the bare bones stuff to get this glitch effect to work. But if you want to learn more, I'll leave some resources down in the description so you can do a deep dive yourself. So the load shader function expects these two files in our file system. So to create them in the P5 editor, you can just come over to this little drop down and click create file. Otherwise you can just create it in your local file system. In our vertex shader, we're pretty much just passing values straight through to our fragment shader. There's not a lot going on here. The only thing of note really in here is that we're remapping our X and Y coordinates of our position vector. And this is because the center of the screen is considered the zero zero coordinate, like I was mentioning before. So we're just remapping it so that it's in the bottom left, like the fragment shader expects. But otherwise, I think for this stage, just copy and paste this shader code. I'm no authority on vertex shaders. I've barely touched them myself. I've pretty much only used them to get to the fragment shader. So take everything I'm saying about the vertex shader with a grain of salt. And like I said, there'll be some resources in the description if you want to learn more. The first thing you'll notice is we've got two different types of variables. So you've got these varying ones and uniform ones. So what varying means is that for each instance of the shader program that's running, it is going to be a different value. And so this makes sense for us because this texture coordinate is the pretty much the pixel that we're drawing on the screen. And that is going to change for each pixel that we want to draw. Uh, whereas the uniform one means it's the same for all of them. So the texture that we're drawing onto the screen is the same for all of them. 
and this noise value, which is our own value, which I'll show you how to set in a minute, it is also gonna be the same for every single instance of the shader program running. So we've got three different variables coming in. So we've got the pixel location, the texture that we wanna draw onto the screen, and then this noise value, which is gonna determine how much of this glitch effect to apply at any given time. And inside of our main function, which is the code that actually gets run on our pixel for this shader, we are just specifying a color that gets output, and this is the color of the pixel on the screen. The way that we specify a color is we give it a vector four, and this is essentially the same as the colors inside of P5JS. It's got an R, a G, a B, and an A value, but instead of going between zero and 255, they go between zero and one. Don't forget the decimal points, that's very important. And you can see with mine, I'm just setting every single pixel to be the same color. And in this case, it's white. But when we run this, you can see that we're still just getting the dark gray screen. And that's because we're not actually using our shader program at all yet. So the first thing we need to do is actually use our glitch shader as the shader for our main display here. So the way we can do that is just simply call the shader function and we pass in our glitch shader that we've loaded in in the preload function and that will set the shader that's being used by our canvas. We actually have to modify how we're displaying things onto the screen because for some reason in P5JS calling image and drawing that image to the screen isn't using our specified shader. I think it, it behind the scenes must still use the P5 image shader or something. I'm not exactly sure. If you know, let me know in the comments, but for the moment we have to modify how we're displaying this onto the screen. And to do that, I've written this little helper function called draw screen. As you can see, I'm calling draw screen where we used to be calling our image function. So inside our draw screen function, I'm going to be passing through these variables into our fragment shader. So if you recall, there was the texture and the noise values that we needed to set ourselves. And so this is what this set uniform does. It sets these variables inside of our glitch shader. So I'm setting the texture value to be the picture of our screen. And then I'm setting the noise value for the moment just to be a value of zero. We'll get to that a bit later. Then what I'm doing is I'm drawing this rectangle that takes up the whole size of the screen. And this is where our shade is going to come in because somehow the program has to figure out the color of each individual pixel inside this rectangle. And so our fragment shader is going to tell it what colors to do. So now when we run this, you can see we get our full white screen like we expected as the output of our shader. So if we come back into our fragment shader now, you can see we've got full manipulation over our color value. So if we say, for example, set this green value to zero, we would expect the screen to be pink. And when we run this, we get our bright pink screen. So this allows us to do things like passing in the texture coordinates as our red and green value. So it's creating this lovely gradient. So as we go further right on the screen, more red is incorporated into our image. And as we go from the bottom to the top of the screen, more green is incorporated and we get this lovely gradient effect but this isn't what we're doing today. So let's get on with the glitch effect. We're passing in a texture with the image that we want to display on the screen and we can sample from this image using the texture2d function. So we pass in the texture that we're sampling from and the coordinates that we want to sample and this will return us a color value of that location in that image. And we can just pass this out as the frag color. And when we run this, you can see we get our dark gray background back, but <laughs> everything is upside down. And this is just because of the way the coordinate system is. So we need to reverse the Y direction. To do the flip, I've pretty much just copied our texture coordinate and then I've inverted the Y on that UV vector. And then I'm using that UV vector inside of our texture2d function instead of the vtex coord. And now when we run this, we get our image drawing back the way that we expect it to be drawn. So what I've done is I've changed how we're sampling the image so that we are now offsetting a little bit for the red value and for the blue value. So I've created this offset vector and we're taking in our noise value and we're going to use that to offset in the X direction. And then I'm using just zero in the Y direction. So we're not offsetting in the Y at all. And then I've set up this color vector and you can see that into the red, I'm grabbing the same texture with the UV, but I'm offsetting by positive offset. So we're moving a little bit to the right for the red value. Then we're just sampling the exact location that we should be for the green, but for the blue, I'm moving a little bit to the left as well. But when we run this, it's not gonna actually display anything because if you recall, we set our noise value to be zero. So let's fix that up next. So first things first, let's try just messing with this noise value and see if it produces the effects that we expect it to. So I've set it to be 0.5 now. And if we run this and draw, you can see that our red and blue are way offset from where they should be. 
Now, the reason this is, is the texture coordinates go between zero and one. So if we're offsetting by 0 0.5, that's a big offset in terms of the image. We're offsetting by half the width of the screen. So we wanna reduce how much impact the noise variable has. So I'm just multiplying it by a small value inside of our offset vector. And now when we run this, you can see that a 0 0.5 value has a way less drastic effect on how the glitch effect appears. So now instead of just passing through a static value of 0 0.5, let's change it with time. So now instead of passing through 0 0.5, I'm passing through the result of this get noise value function. And as you can see, I've written that function down here. And what it does is it calls the Perlin noise function inbuilt into P5.js and it calls it with the milliseconds that our program has been running. So this is just a really simple way of getting a value that changes over time. I'm also then just doing some simple processing on it so that if the value is beneath 0 0.5, we're just gonna return it as zero. So we only get spikes in the glitch if the value is above 0 0.5 and the spikes ramp up after 0 0.5. So if we input a value of say 0 0.6, we'll only get a tiny little glitch. And if we get a value of one back from the noise, it'll be a massive glitch. So this will just give us a sort of natural glitch effect. So now when we run this, you can see we get this really convincing glitch effect and it happens in these random little bursts based on the Perlin noise. And I've treated you to my very best mouse drawing. As you can see, I am an expert when it comes to drawing with the mouse. And just remember, this isn't limited to drawing lines on this canvas. You can draw images, you can draw rectangles, you can do whatever you normally do inside your P5.js sketches. If you just do it onto this screen variable and then apply this shader effect, you can make it glitch out as well. I really hope you've learned something from today's video. There'll be resources, like I said, that can dive deeper into shader code if that's something that you're interested in. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. There's a video here that YouTube reckons you'd like next. Otherwise, there's a playlist here with all my other P5.js videos in it. I'll see you next time.